<laughs> We'd like to call the evening session of our major this evening to introduce the speaker for this evening, one who needs no introduction to you as members of NFO. And those who may be here for the first time, I'd like to give you just a little insight into the man, one who has dedicated his life to correcting the grave injustice out in rural America, one who will not sacrifice principle, one who has been a man of steel, as it were, as he pursued his course in directing this industry. One who has led NFO through many, many battles, and we have survived the onslaught of the most powerful agencies in this country under his leadership. Only this last few days, he has been seated in Kansas City, there under examination and cross-examination for nine solid days, with 22 attorneys trying to pick apart his testimony and cross-examine him to find fault and flaw in the programs which he has so courageously embraced and uh, taught to we as farmers and ranchers. One who has been sought out by the president as opinion being vital as far as agriculture is concerned, and I'll have to tell this story briefly. We were in board meeting a short time ago and the telephone rang. The liaison man for the White House called, and President Carter was coming into Des Moines. And he asked that President Staley meet the plane there and be in the reception line of a few people. And he asked Orrin Lee if he could make it, and Orrin Lee said, no, he says, I'm not interested. My goal and purpose is that of promoting agriculture and solving the problem that's out in rural America, and I don't believe it can be solved there in the reception line. And I suppose this somewhat shocked the gentleman because he said in return, Ornley, what do you want? Would you like a presidential appointment or would, do you have somebody that you would like one for? And Ornley's reply was, you ask me a question, I have the responsibility to answer you. I don't want anything. Let me introduce to you your national president, President Ornley Staley. Officers, members of the board of directors, delegates, and investors. It's the job of the president to report the state of affairs of the organization. In a couple of very simple direct statements, I can say that the NFO has never been in as good a shape nor never has approached the opportunities it has this hour. I start off on that statement because it's my job to back that statement and those sentences up. But never before in the history of the NFO have we met at any time when the critical situation in agriculture even approaches what it is this hour. Never have we met in a convention where so much rides on the decisions that are made, not the decisions in words, but the individual decisions that are made of what you and I do. We have said many times in the last few years that NFO offers the only hope for the American farmer. I believe that more firmly tonight than I ever believed it at any time I've said it before. That's you and I talking to each other. 
That's you and I making a decision. A decision as to what we're going to do come Monday morning. What we're going to do a week from Monday morning. And what we're going to do until the ground is tilled in the spring. You know, I believe for the last couple of years that those that have said we were a secret organization were right. We're the most secret organization on to what the NFO has been achieving of any group that ever walked, the, walked this land. We've been living in the past, thinking in the past, and not realizing what's the present. So I clear up that point. I proudly have said several times that the interpretation of what has been put on the NFO as being secret, though, is mean we have been confidential in our business of going about establishing collective bargaining. But our members have known that attended the meetings that we have urged you to attend, that to my knowledge yet today, that there's not a single unanswered question that the members have asked an answer for that they haven't been given a direct answer backed up with documents to prove those statements were right. Not once, to my knowledge, has that ever happened in our organization. And if it has happened, I want to correct it before we leave this convention. There were those that have asked me many questions, many things that we have done and why. But you know, I said if our people hadn't have known when we had the SEC crisis, when we together raised $5.2 million that Saturday in Des Moines, Iowa, if we had had to explain to our members why and what, they would have hung me from the nearest rafter knowing farmers instead of raising $5.2 million. They already knew. The public didn't know, but our members knew because we had gone over with them in detail the whys, the whereofs, and how the money had been spent and what the plans were. And never once in all the investigations of the various government agencies did I have one fear. Only a moment of fear once in court in the SEC case is whether or not our story was going to get across to the judge in an understandable way. But not one fear that there was ever going to be anything found corrupt or misuse of funds in the NFO if they sent every accountant in this nation to our headquarters, and they sent plenty of them. <clears throat> but I want to turn our attention to what I said a secret organization. You have heard this afternoon Roger Slotik present to you the statistical data in a very professional way that shows how we study, how we use and accumulate data to do a very scientific job in the last few months of determining what farmers by age groups were thinking, what they had on their minds. But in gathering that data, 
We've had groups of young farmers into the Corning office. And the amazing thing is how little they know and how little the general public, as far as farmers know, about our structure and the progress we're making. And that's the reason I say that we're right now the most perfect secret organization that there is in this country. Because we have not been talking to the farmers in a positive manner explaining the progress we are making. I want to ask you a few questions. Have you heard that in the last 14 weeks, the volume in the hog department has increased 80%. Have you heard that as we come into this convention, that we're going to be able to announce, and many of you know it, but have you heard the contracts of vital importance, three major packers, one the largest hog killing plant in the nation, strategically located, the biggest hog killer in the nation, and the biggest and oldest established packer of years gone by, that in the last few days have renegotiated or have we have negotiated contracts with them with formulations in those contracts far exceeding anything we've ever had in the years gone by. Have you heard that we are getting grade A outlets, the prime outlets, right in the heart of the Midwest we're in? That right now we need 42 million pounds more milk per month to fill the contracts that we can get right now? Have you heard that in the last four weeks in the slaughter cattle division that we've increased our volume 70% in slaughter cattle over what we have been on a weekly average over quite a period of time in fact, months and years. Have you heard that we are handling almost 10% of the nation's sunflowers this year of a little more than a million acres planted? Have you heard that the stalker and feeder division is meeting an equaling record volume in the last few weeks? Have you heard that we moved a big volume of grain last week, representing barge loads of corn in particular? from the river system structure that's going to be available for winter, moving out into January and February at a very advantageous price comparable to what you could get locally now. Have you heard that our statistics show now that on the one-year membership agreement that in the age bracket of 24 to 38, that farmers on blind contacts just taking the names of farmers in that age group, that 22.8% are joining the NFO on first contact? <laughs> now I'm going to ask you something else, have you heard? Have you heard that somebody sold a load of cattle steers eight years ago and they got paid for a Holstein cow or a cow somewhere? Have you heard that somebody got their calves graded too low nine years ago or eight years ago?
Have you heard that six years ago we moved milk out of the pattern and it cost 50 cents a hundred to do it? What have we been talking about? How many of you would want a new member to come into your county meetings, really, and hear a rehash of what happened six years ago? What have you heard? And what are you going to hear going out of this convention? Have you heard that in the last few months of the professional help extending over the last couple of years or so that we have added to assist us? Have you heard that in the hog department we have added to our staff a man that was in charge of fresh meat sales for one of the largest packers, hog killers in this country, that he was in charge of procurement for that company and, and additionally was manager of their largest hog kill plant or the second, that he is recognized in the hog packing industry as one of the very top people in this nation and particularly by the company that he used to be with. Have you heard that we've added to our staff in the last three months a man that managed a cattle slaughter plant that was a head cattle buyer for one of the three top companies that was a cattle buyer for the Western, from Western Iowa for the largest cattle killing slaughtering operation in this nation? In top, on top of that, in charge of the feedlot operation of one of the three largest companies. Have you heard that we've added to the dairy department of men that the top dairy companies in this country have great respect for his ability and that at times he's done consulting work as well as having worked for them? Have you heard the expertise and the professionalism that we've added to the grain department? Have you heard that over the last five or six years, we have put together one of the most extensive computerized systems operated by the top management people that we could secure in this nation? All of these additions to a system and a structure that is available to the farmers in this country. And I can share with you your apprehensions. I can share with you your lack of confidence for a time. Because we had to do so many things that we never expected to have to do. In 1965, we thought that we, once we made the breakthrough of delivery with products, hogs in particular, with a good verbal agreement on hogs, that we had it made. And as we lined up, not a thousand in one plant, but plant after plant, thousand, two thousand head of hogs a day on a verbal agreement. That was an excellent agreement, but we had no way to monitor that. We had no way to inspect it. And when the buyers on the company's property got through with our members, the members got butchered instead of the hogs by a very clever little statement when our members said the price is not what it should be. 
They'd very quietly say to them, if you hadn't come through the NFO, you could have gotten a quarter more. What a job of public relations they did for us. And so we had to go to the collection point system. And we had to then take that collection point system and get the buyers out first. And after we did that, we started moving hogs in the patterns that we determined. And when we started, we just got the price that maybe somebody else got, with the expense and the transportation in addition. And then we got 10 cents over the average of the Minnesota, interior Minnesota, interior Iowa, southern Minnesota. We used to call about it the means, which meant the average, 10 cents over. And then finally we got up to a whopping 35 cents. But today those contracts are comparable this way, 75 cents over the top of the mid-session quote plus transportation. I could go on and on. The development of the reloads in milk and the grain accumulation points in grain, or in grain and the dairy reloads. But have you heard that we have 236 livestock collection points across this nation. Some of them were a little rusty until we started our move forward with new contracts. Have you heard that we have 47 milk reloads scattered over the nation? Have you heard that we have 24 barge loading points member-owned or throughput agreements with? Have you heard that we have 100 rail loading loadout points by our own, by our members, or throughput agreements with an additional 100 trackside loads that can be used occasionally as well as throughputs that can be used occasionally. A system and a structure that covers this nation from Maine to California and from Canada almost to the Gulf of Mexico. There has never been a system and a structure like it put together in America. And so I can view your apprehensions of history, of memories, because it got to the point while we were developing these and in 1971 they told us it would take five years at least to develop a computerized system. And those that were on the board of directors heard that. I didn't think it was possible to take that long, but it did. They were right. And then to get additional management people to help and continue to get it. And get the professional know-how. In grain, the best people that we could find from a major company, top management. In facilities and the movement of grain and adding to that, a top rail transportation man from one of the big companies in this country. And I'm talking about us having gotten in each and every segment of the major agricultural commodities what I believe are at least one of the top 25 people in the nation in their field. They can't do the job, but the great assistance they've given to us. And you know, when you're putting out a game plan, they're not policy makers, but they give us information, not information, and not a one of them have I ever heard. And I know they haven't always been happy, but from a matter and standpoint of ethics, and I know some of them couldn't have been happy with every company and every executive they worked with, 
but I have never yet heard one of those top administrative people ever be critical of somebody that they worked with in their company or their past company policies. Never have I heard them say that the company that they worked for did something a certain way or to give out any vital information that that company might have had. But I'll tell you one thing, they know the industry and when you're making a game plan, it's awful nice to know how the others play the game too, you know. And that's really what it boils down of knowing and getting the information of how the old marketing system has operated and how it has achieved the profit results for companies that it has. Not in detail, not in examples, but through experience in making the plans. That's different, though, than what we talk about, isn't it, really? And I know that I can view your apprehension because there was a time through this development that I can tell you that instead of going out and pushing and getting more production through the programs and setting up the organizational charts and structures, I can tell you honestly, there got to a point that I didn't want much more production. All it meant was more problems. And that's being frank with you, isn't it? That meant the more people, when I went out to the meeting, talked about what happened to this and what happened to that. But I can also tell you now that we don't have to apologize for one minute with the system and structure that we have that it's intact and it's ready to go for collective bargaining and all we have to do is to make it go. <laughs> We're all humans. There may be some errors here and there. But they're accountable for and they can be corrected. That's just a minor thing now. That used to be a major thing because we didn't have the structure in the system. And so that structure and system had to be there. And let me talk to you for a few moments about the change in agricultural production and the change in the movement in the processing industry and in the retail structure. It used to be that you could take anything from a veal calf to a prime steer to a lot of cattle slaughtering plants, wasn't it? And that's the reason the way we used to operate, we could have achieved results because you didn't have to do many of the things we do now. In the 68 meat holding action, you could still sell in most plants anything from a veal calf to a choice or prime steer. But today, because of the consumer desires, because of the consumer purchasing power varying, you can take a chain store structure that maybe has got 80 stores in one city, and there's probably not over 10 of those that'll use the same cuts, the same quality. They vary within that city. And for them to vary, they've got to get it from meatpacking plants that vary in their slaughter and their kill. That's the reason that we have to start with our livestock collection points, sorting the cattle by grade, species, weights, and putting them together. That's the reason that we had to put professional graders that have had a lifetime of experience in grading hogs so that we have the right hogs, the right weight, the right grades at the right plant. And that's the reason that we can get formulations 
like we're getting. If you sold certain size hams to a particular outlet and you do like we used to do, and that is we paid on a 220 to 230 weight hog, and we made the average all right a lot of times from 170 to 260, you know. What do you do with those? You destroy your bargaining power completely. And this goes on down to what we have to consider. It used to be that your hogs ran in the pasture. And if you wanted to let, keep them a little longer, you could. But today, much of the hog production in this country is like a factory line where that when those hogs reach a certain weight, they go out and another bunch comes in. On cattle, it used to be that if you fed cattle to prime, they were worth more when they were 1,150 pounders than they were at 1,000. A choice, weren't they? Today, you feed them longer and you get them into grade yield four is what happened to you. And you have to get those to the right plant at the right time. Those are all essential parts. And they're part of explaining the necessity of a highly professionalized collection, dispatch, and delivery system that we've put together. That's the reason that we're getting contracts with the top grade A outlets, the key contracts that keeps us from shipping milk out Another 200 miles, somebody else will be doing that as we take over outlet after outlet. It's the reason that we're getting contracts on cattle and hogs. And it's the reason that we're getting the contracts also in grain. Dependable suppliers with the right product, the right quality, the right grade at the right time at the right place. And our system and structure has got so many advantages. Farm fresh or ranch fresh calves. How many of you have ever bought a couple of three-day-old calf to put on a cow to raise you a little beef and butter at the, at the uh, local auction sale barn? and lost about half of them and doctored all of them. And if you went to the same farm and picked that calf up on the farm and brought it direct to your farm, most times there wasn't any sickness, was there? The same works on a volume of stockers and feeders. The quality programs and milk all those that will be explained in the commodity meetings tomorrow. And I can tell you tonight, with the professional assistance that we have gotten to help us, it didn't mean replacing other people, it means adding to the team. Building an all-around team of performance. But I can tell you, that any of you that don't think you can learn something to going to those commodity meetings tomorrow, I can tell you there's not the biggest cattle feeder in this country that can learn something in that slaughter cattle meeting, that there's not the biggest hog producer in this country that won't learn something about the production and, and processing of hogs and the packing plants coming back to their structure, or there won't be anybody that's in there, I don't care how much grain they've marketed, that they won't learn something in grain, and the same speaks for dairy, the same speaks for sunflowers, and the company officials that'll be here tomorrow, including the agricultural attaché from West Germany, from France, from the largest companies in the various fields that'll be in these commodity meetings. So let's think for a little moment 
that we can learn more from our organization now because of what you've helped put together than any group of farmers could ever learn. And a lot of farmers paid $400 to be able to pick up a telephone and find out what happened on the Board of Trade in somebody's projection, $400 a year. And I happen to be in one or two of those offices, and there's not a person in there that any ways near starts to compare with the type of professional people that I'm talking about. They were a group of economists as predictors or record keepers. These people have been there, and I can tell you that many times they can predict very accurately what's going to happen in the markets because of what certain companies may be doing in the, either their plant kill, laying off workers, cutting back their force, or whatever it might be. But this system could be the best, and I believe, is approaching the best marketing system in this country. You have to market before you bargain. But it isn't a marketing system that we're building. It's a collective bargaining system that we're building. And so when we think it's simple, and it's easy, we found out that that's not true. But we're also proving every day, every week, that we're able to do something that nobody else can do, a system and a structure that's coordinated nationwide in every major commodity, and in almost every hook and nook and corner of this country that that commodity is produced. And if there's going to be collective bargaining in American agriculture, the farmers of this nation, if they're going to bargain together in collective bargaining, they're going to have to realize they have to make a commitment. They have to make a commitment with their production. And when they make a commitment with their production, that means for delivery and for bargaining. You can't bargain with thin air, and you can't deliver thin air or hot air either. You're going to deliver the commodity that you've contracted delivery. But do you know that the power of a contract in business is the most powerful tool in business? That once contracts are achieved, it's like putting a stone behind a wagon that would roll back downhill. You put a block behind what gains you've made. And do you know what individual selling is? When you sell as an individual and you get a quarter more, you think, than somebody else, you've really set the ceiling. You know why? Because if a buyer was paying a certain price and he couldn't get quite enough, and he could come out and pay you a quarter more and fulfill his plant needs, he doesn't need any more. You set the ceiling right there, haven't you? But if you sell as a group, when you move your production at a price, you have established a floor. Because then everybody has to try to beat you in order to break up your block or to keep your block of production from growing. To me, that seems very simple and something that we all ought to understand. And we ought to be able to explain that. Because if we can't explain it, all we have to do is to look back over the history of agriculture. And that's the way farmers have always done it. When they went to the marketplace and said, what will you give me? 
they let others determine their price. And the critical financial situation that the American farmers are in tonight, and it is for real, it's there, is not because that they hoped and hoped and hoped that it would go away. But it's there because everybody else in this economy is organized except the American farmer. That's the reason it's there. And let me explain that for a moment. Companies that buy agricultural commodities, four or five large companies, buy on control and sell 50 to 70 percent of the total production. You can take that throughout every segment of our economy and you'll find the same economic power bases developed in four or five companies. But they're smarter than individual farmers. When a steel company, one of the top five or six, usually one of the top three, announces a price increase, within a few days' time, all the other steel companies have announced a comparable increase, haven't they? Now, they don't have to do it. Some of them undoubtedly could keep the lower prices. But they've learned a long time cutthroat competition destroys profit. But the American farmers have been proud of their independence, saying, I want to price my products myself. Labor organized. The companies price their products. Labor bargains for wages. And let's just look where we're at for a little bit as farmers. We're so proud to be able to say that we're so independent. But in the end, as everybody else is organized, it meant every time a company raises their profits, raises their prices to maintain or increase their profits, you pay for it. And every time that labor bargains for a higher wage, the American farmers pay their part of it. And then you go to the marketplace and so say, what will you give me? And you have no way to keep pace with the rest of the economy. Let's see where we are. The school teachers were one of those groups comparable to farmers because they felt a moral responsibility to teach the little kids that came to school. They didn't feel that they should strike, that they should organize. And how far did it go? Well, people with a doctor's degree, and this is not belittling the occupation, but it used to be the janitor, and then they got updated, I don't know what's the latest name they call them, custodian and then on up. Maybe with hardly any education, were proving that they were smarter than the people with a doctor's degree because they were getting more dollars to take home. And so finally the smart ones began to get smart. And then let's take a look at the black people in this country. There's a lot of people that look down on them. And I'm proud of the, the blacks, farmers that we have in our organization. I'm proud of them. <laughs> well, let me go ahead and see where we are. I wanted to say that so there's a clear understanding. Not too many years without opportunities. And all they had was their human bodies. They couldn't even vote in a lot of places. Hardly. And I don't want to get into those big ramifications of past history. But you know, they not even got on the back of the bus. They got up to the front of the bus by uniting their strength. Now, if they were on the bottom of the totem pole 
and they're making progress where does that leave the American farmers today? You tell me a group of people in this country that are lower on the economic totem pole, the economic ladder, than the American farmers, I'd like to know what group it is. The costs of production to produce the food in this country is continuing to rise. And so we have to recognize what it takes. It takes people. And I hope that when you go to those commodity meetings tomorrow, you will observe the structure behind each of those commodity departments. And I can tell you tonight that the great crowd we have here, that there was no question in our minds but what this auditorium would be running over if the weather had been decent tonight. And there's times in the history of NFO it would have been catastrophe with all the people that are tied up in the weather and the buses and couldn't even get out of their driveways all over a lot of this country. But we have the best organized commodity structure that this country has ever seen, and it's in operation, and it's growing every day, and that combined with the contracts we're getting is the reason we're growing in commodity volume. <laughs> We proved beyond a doubt that never before in the history of this country has there been a group of people organized from nation farthest point to the nation's farthest point clear across this country as fast as we did it. Setting up county structures and building them. And now we only have one thing to prove and collective bargaining with contracts at the cost of production are in our hands. And that is that we can organize the production just as fast and as solidly as we organize people behind the structure we built. And that's a great challenge. And that's a structure. And so nothing has a crippling effect on the NFO now because of the commodity structure that's being built in every commodity, to build the volume, unite the volume, and to deliver the volume in every major commodity and from every corner of this country. And I can tell you, there's no question in my mind and there's no question in the minds of a lot of the top company executives in this country of what it takes. I personally have become acquainted with the president, the chairman of the board, and certainly the top administrative officer of most of the major companies in dairy, meat, and grain. And if I haven't, some of the other people have. And without exception, they tell us that they're not concerned about the general price level. They're concerned about whether their competitors can buy cheaper. And if their competitors can buy cheaper, it's because farmers as individuals will sell cheaper. That's the only reason. And so the structure, the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system that goes across this country makes it possible for us to get contracts at the cost of production plus a reasonable profit and to maintain them because we're going to have 
a part of the nationwide collection dispatch and dis delivery structure, whether it's livestock collection points, dairy reloads, grain accumulation points, that are close enough together. That so that if we'll say, for example, they were 100 miles apart, and some buyer right in the middle tries to buy cheaper, it's only 50 miles to a place we can deliver that product under contract. And that means that the transportation will not kill us. And that company that's trying to buy cheaper will either have to bid up or the farmers will come to us in greater numbers. But in order to do that, the system has to be operating and you have to have your production going through that system to get your contact contracts and to protect them. And this gets down to Operation 30. It's not new. It's not old. It's timeless, though, because it'll be true next month, next year, 10 years from now, for a little over 12 months, we've been explaining it. It's the soundest proposal that the American farmers have ever have, have had presented to them. But we don't understand it, maybe. What is it? That we put together 30% of the nation's total production coming from every area that commodity is produced going through our nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system. And then we get together in not larger than 10 county area meetings. And what are we going to do? Does anybody know? Have you heard? Have you heard what's going to be done in those 10 county meetings? We're going to vote on our prices as farmers based on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And have you heard what we're going to do then? We're going to announce those prices to the world. And have you heard what we're going to do and what we've been saying for 12, 14 months? That if we do not get our prices and our contracts, what happens then, have you heard? You can call it a holding action or a strike or whatever you want to call it, but it will stay within the legal bounds of the laws of this country. But I can tell you one thing, when we go, we know how to organize it. And I'm not belittling anybody else's efforts. I applaud everybody else's efforts. But you remember what we put together in the past, a county structure with county officers, a Minuteman system where you only had to make four or five calls to contact every farmer clear across this country in the matter of a few hours' time, right, with the latest information and with tape recorders for the meetings. Now we can even update that with the CBs, I guess. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. We had the holding actions for a purpose, one for recognition. We fought from 58 to 65 for recognition. So companies that even recognize us to take production. And then in 1968, we had the holding action to get written contracts. We got them. 
And today we don't need recognition. We're dealing with practically every major company in dairy, meat, and grain in this country. All we need is production to back up our contracts and to get more and to tie it down. That's all we need. And I believe that it's very likely that with our ability to prove that we are putting together a system that is doing it professionally, the best job in this country of the best quality program, quality control program in dairy, the best program of getting the right cattle to the right plant at the right time, to get the right grain at the right place at the right time for export domestic or direct export, or to go on through the same with hogs, then I believe that when companies realize that the production is put together through that system, I believe that we can sign a contract that's a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. But I don't want to go on my belief alone. I want them to understand that we'll sit down in a business-like way and agree to the terms of the contracts to assure cost of production plus a reasonable profit. But when we reach that point, and they don't go and they don't refuse, I want them to know from this convention that I don't believe I know we haven't lost our courage, our will, and our determination to fight when the chips are down, when the chips are all on the table, we throw in the marbles and say, okay, this is it, or the holding action or strike is on. And I, when that happens, when that happens, I want that holding action or strike to be so well organized that it won't be many hours that you don't have to read the newspaper, you don't have to listen to the TV, you don't have to listen enough, anything. The farmers themselves with their own communication system will know that they're getting the job done. And I don't want a long, drawn-out holding action or a strike. I want it when we, if we have to use it, that it be fast, we put to quickly put together on the structure that we've developed, and I wanted to be sure that everybody understands that it is and has been and will be done in a legal way. And I want to say this, while I'm talking to you tonight, one of the things that always concerned me, and it hurt, was the charge of violence. I do not know of an NFO member, to my knowledge, that was ever arrested. And I and the other leaders of NFO knew that we had to build the emotions of people. You have to build the emotions of people to get them to act for their own welfare. But I and everybody else felt personally responsible as leaders that if we built the emotions to fight a battle, we had the leadership responsibility to keep those emotions within the bounds of the laws of this country. Many of the criticisms that came to me and others over the years were people that didn't maybe particularly agree with that. But it can't be done any other way. It has to be done with farmers' understanding. It has to be with them believing together they have the strength. Because, as I used to tell our people, if you think you're bigger than the Army, the, Navy's and the, the Navy, and the Marines, and the National Guard, go right ahead and do it. There are laws to live by in this country. And the, you don't have to break the laws as farmers. You have plenty of laws that give you adequate rights to price your products. The only ingredient it takes is the farmer's will, understanding, and determination. They have to decide they're going to do the same thing long enough together 
to accomplish something that's lasting. Somebody said not long ago the biggest problem with farmers was that they never wanted to do the same thing more than four hours at a time. And you know, get to thinking back, except in harvest and planting, that's about right, isn't it? To make collective bargaining work and to price our products, we got to do the same thing long enough to achieve lasting results. And so that means that it's our responsibility. Before this convention is going to come, the farm strike vote on Friday. The resolution that has been prepared for the consideration is very clear on several points. And I want to say this from the outset, that I have said from the beginning, as outlined by the Board of Directors, that we are pleased to see the farmers becoming aroused and working together. And I want to say to our leaders and to our members, this is a time to be unselfish. Don't be selfish. Don't go out and say, I told you so. Don't go out and say, you're doing just what the NFO has been doing. And this resolution spells out pretty clearly what the Board of Directors, what members coming into this convention, and what the Resolutions Committee unanimously adopted, as I understand. It is our feeling, it's my feeling personally, that at this time, that we should not forget that what the farm strike effort is doing is the further selling of an idea that is necessary to achieve collective bargaining results. And that when we look at it, that it's a great point of an atmosphere, a spontaneous atmosphere. And it may be a little hard for NFO members or leaders to sit back and watch somebody else maybe take the show in the area where NFO has been alone. But I say that our whole policy over the years, whatever matter was, whenever we thought an idea was sound in the legislative field or wherever it may be, we supported it, whoever came up with it. For us not to take this position and for the NFO to take any other position than what the resolution says would hurt the spontaneous atmosphere that's surrounding the farm strike, as I understand it. And we've always had the attitude that we wanted the job done for the American farmers. And today, as it has always been, it's not important who does it. 
It's not important who the leader is. The only importance is that the job is done to get the American farmers a cost of production plus a reasonable profit. And so I hope that the understanding of this resolution is clear on several points. Number one, and that is that the NFO wholeheartedly supports the right of farmers to strike. Number two, that we give unqualified support to the, what well, we understand, the main objectives of the farm strike effort. That number two, number three, that we believe that if we were to make any move now in the NFO, that it would take away from the spontaneous reaction that's going on among farmers in this, over much of this country. And that we feel that for us to move in, it would appear that we're trying to take over or run. And I don't want to see anything interfere with a spontaneous atmosphere that's developing. And next, that we, as a convention, authorize the Board of Directors to call a strike or a holding action on grain or any of the other or all commodities when they feel it's the proper time. These are times in agriculture that are different and uncertain on many areas, in many areas. They're uncertain because of different ingredients. I was up at a meeting in Minnesota where a fellow came to me and he said, we believe that we can get the job done because we're tougher than you guys were. I said, you know, you're talking about a group of guys that crawled through the foxholes of Europe and Africa, and the foxholes from island to island in the Pacific. There was never a tougher bunch of people that ever walked this earth. But I said, you know, I think it's great. We were up against something that was tough. And that is, coming back from World War II, there were many farmers that had stayed on the farm and done pretty well financially. And they were affiliated with various groups and they believed in the law of supply and demand and they outnumbered us. But I said I believe the young farmers in this country are a different breed. I don't think they're tied to the old and the past as farmers in previous generations were. And I think that there's a real chance 
that the farmers that made up the NFO, that saw the necessity of collective bargaining and willing to fight for it with their money and their efforts, and the combination of the young farmers today, that the two can win the battle for collective bargaining. And I believe that. So we have the situations. And now I want to throw out something that, again, may not be popular tonight. But I want you to listen. I want you to think. And again, there's a little change, in fact, quite a little change, from the past. Because we've always said that credit is not what we needed. What we needed was price. And that I wholeheartedly agree with and say tonight. But I want to see us come out of this convention with a credit structure system to protect every farmer that's a member of the NFO in this nation, whatever state he might be in. And what am I going to say? I want credit committees elected in each and every county to offer the opportunity to farmers that are members of the NFO to consult with that committee, to ask that committee if they desire to go to the local financial institutions to visit with the lenders, realizing that the financial institutions cannot avoid the responsibility of remaining financially sound and that they may not be able to loan the money to that farmer. But that then we keep a record of every farmer that's a member of the NFO that's not getting credit and we take it to our congressional district level organization the names, and this is where the fight really begins at this point. At this point, there's one source of money that can take care of every farmer in this country's financial needs to keep them in business. And that's through the FHA, and that takes congressional appropriation. What is our effort on this? We hear a lot of talk from the politicians how they are for farmers. They can vote an appropriation of $2.1 billion for New York City. They can vote hundreds of million dollars a month and a year for the railroads in this country. And I don't hesitate that if it takes all the tractors in this country in Washington, D.C., till they vote the appropriations to keep the farmers from going out of business, that that ought to be done, too. This takes a nationwide effort, and it can assure the farmers in this country that no longer is a source of credit just a local credit source that's available. It's going to be a total effort of a nationwide structure to assure that not a farmer goes out of business this spring because they can't get credit. Now, let me answer some of the critics right now. I hear them say, well, that young farmer didn't have to buy that $40,000 tractor. No, and neither does he have to be a second-class citizen just because he's a farmer in this country either.
And I say that that credit committee coordinated over this country, county by county, is of vital importance because it's not the young farmer's fault that the prices have dropped 40, 50 percent on many of the commodities. There's not a company in this country, there's not a company in this country that has built a new factory that could have, take half the price for the products they process and exist either. That's not inefficiency, it's economic hardship at this particular point, and we cannot let the present economic hardship destroy the young farmers and American family type agriculture in this nation. Now some will say that price is what we need. I think I can speak, the NFO can speak better than anybody, that there hasn't been a fight for better prices in, the, in this nation in the last 10 years that the NFO hasn't been right in the middle of it. And I can tell you now at the critical time for the American farmers, we're going to be right in the middle of it now too. Now I know what's going to be said, probably, and that is it won't work. It can't be done. Well, there's a lot of things that can be done people by people. There's a lot of things that can be done. And I won't buy from any rural congressman the fact that they don't have enough votes. They trade votes in the House and the Senate every day on issues. And if we don't have congressmen that can get enough support in this country for the farmers of this country to produce the food that's on the table, the people in New York, San Francisco, Seattle, and Chicago, then we better get a better new congressman or a senator from our states or our congressional district. <laughs> and some will say, well, you can't keep everybody in. Who knows who's efficient and who isn't when prices have dropped 30 or 40 percent? Until we get the price is up. I say that we have to fight for credit to cover their operating expenses and keep them in business, every farmer in this country. Now let's talk about the far range repercussions. And there's some people that may laugh at this, but I'll bet you they won't laugh at it 30 days from now at the 15th day of January. The prime interest that everybody is going to have in their mind, the prime attention is going to be whether we're going to get enough credit immediately to stay in business. Because it doesn't do any good after they're forced out, does it? For them, that's too late. And once it's too late, it's too late forever. That fight can be waged very successfully. And it can be won. Because, you know, election year is coming up too. And that's the time to get the results. And that's the time that it can be done. Where do we go? What do we do? We want a meeting tomorrow evening in this auditorium of the young farmers from 24 to 38. We want to lay out to them their responsibility and what they have to do communicating with their age group. Tell them how to do it. The rest of you that are older ought to know by now how to communicate with your group. 
And not that the young people don't. Frankly, I don't think any of us have done a very good job of telling the young farmers in this country really what collective bargaining is all about in the structure. We've talked to them about every gripe and every bellyache we've had and got away sometimes from the goals and aspirations of this organization. The goals and aspirations of rural America and agriculture and the part it plays. Farmers have more strength than industry and labor combined. All they have to do is to use it right, use it long enough, and they're going to get the job done for themselves. But the far-reaching points of this credit, I don't believe the corporations in this nation want to buy the farmland and operate it. They tried it, you know. It didn't work. But you know how vertical integration can take over the agriculture of this country and take over the vitality and management of the young farmers in this country? If they don't have adequate sources of credit and the only place they can get credit to cover operating expenses from the conglomerate corporations of this country, yes, even the co-ops that are using it, so that then they take over the production and the control of the sale of that production, then American family type agriculture is gone. And if we don't make that stand right now to assure them an independent credit source, we can say that we sat by and saw American family type agriculture destroyed because we didn't have the foresight or the courage or the determination to wage the battle on all fronts, not just on the pricing front alone. That's our answer. We must get it as quick as possible. But we also must protect our flanks at every corner because this is a battle and struggle for survival of the family type structure of agriculture in this country. And that's our job and that's our responsibility. And it's our job and our responsibility with the structures that we put together that we go out of this convention, every one of us determined. You know, it's so much easier than it used to be in a lot of ways. Instead of a three quarters of a million head of hog producers, right now the statistics show something like 55,000. The major producers and hogs in this country. Most of those are family type farm operations. It means that our job, though, has to be done right. And it means if a holding action is contemplated, it has to be big enough, planned enough, so that it shows that there's contracts there to be gotten. And that if a holding action is called, it's not going to be of long duration and everybody individually understands the objectives. That's just an example of what I'm talking about. But it's an example of actual reality. In conclusion, a lot of people have said to me over the years, what makes you stick around? What makes you take all of the abuse? Well, you know, it never really bothered me. I can truthfully say that. But I have thought many, many times about a lot of things. I never worried whether I was elected president, despite what some people thought, but I'm the only one that happens to know, you know. Why? Because I had confidence in myself. As long as I had my health, I wasn't going to worry about making a living. Besides that, I happened to live with the family in the house I was born in, the fourth generation there now. There's a lot of heritage and a lot of fun back there to enjoy. And it's always been a good, decent-sized operation. 
family farm operation. So I never really worried. And that's the reason I always said to the delegates truthfully and wholeheartedly that you shouldn't politic for a position in the NFO, in my opinion. It's a cause of people. Elect whoever can do the best job. If you elect me, I'll do the best I can. And any time that I couldn't put my whole heart and soul in it, I wouldn't have even taken it. But you know why I really hung around? I knew there was going to come a time that there was going to be a critical period for the American farmers, including our farm and every other farm. And if I could contribute to putting a structure together that was ready, and could contribute to uniting the farmers to so agriculture as a family type structure could be saved. Then I sort of wanted to be there at that time, you know. And I guess from a personal standpoint, I've always thought as a matter of pride. And my pride is not going to carry me over in to what's not necessary. But you know, it'd just be fun maybe for the people in New York City and Chicago and Seattle and San Francisco to realize that the food does come from the farm instead of off of the little cart they push around. But that's just a personal thing that passes. But I stayed around for one day And that day I pledge to you that I'll make it come, if possible, yet this winter. Together, we have to make that pledge. I can't do it. It takes all of us. It could be done in a short time. I'm not saying it's going to be done this winter. If you can tell me how many farmers will unite their production for collective bargaining, I can look up the meat statistics and show you about six days meat supply and processing storage and transportation. 48 hours fluid milk supply. And grain that could be stored and many other things that could be done. But all I want to say to you is that when we do it, I want it to be done right within the laws of this country. And I want it, be, it to be big enough and organized well enough that it won't take very long. I don't want the farmers to ever abuse their power, but I don't want them abused because they aren't using their power either. And I am looking for forward to one day that as a farmer and calling on you to help make it possible by making it your top priority to get new members, get production, and organize the county solidly